Hello and welcome viewers to this edition of Swarajya Conversations. With me today is Vikram Sampath, author, biographer, historian, author of many books, but the one we're going to discuss today is the second volume of his biography of Veer Savarkar. The first volume as you all know came about 2 years ago and it was very well received. And the second volume I'm sure which looks even heftier Uh, is probably likely to be equally well received because it is breaks the concluding part. The first part dealt with Savarkar's early life and his rebel or rebel uh, nature, where he was transported to the Andamans as a political detainee. He spent several years there, gruesome years, difficult years. Then he was returned to Ratnagiri and released from there. from where he started his major writings on hindutva and other things so uh, the first volume and the second volume together complete his life the second volume deals with the period after 1924 once he was back in his motherland and he started writing more details and taking part in the developing political movements of the day including the hindu mahasabha and the freedom movement and other things so swikram uh, welcome first Thank you. Uh, before we get into the book proper, uh, by the way, let me first show you which is the second volume. This is the second volume of the book, Savarkar, a contested legacy. But more than that, um, let me start with the previous book. Just one question. Uh, first, how did it do, and um, uh, what what is different in the second volume as a composed uh, compared to the first? yeah thank you jackie always such a pleasure talking to you uh, and yeah the, uh, the first volume actually you know quite surpassed my own expectations and those of my publishers too uh, i think it went into multiple reprints uh, you know six seven reprints already uh, and translations uh, this very month we are actually coming out with the marathi translation as also the hindi translation of the book and i think kannada is also underway uh, hopefully it gets into many more languages so that it's accessible to people after all we talking and speaking in english we probably reach only 2 to 5% of the uh, population of india uh, though we assume for ourselves a very very presumptuous uh, you know uh, position yeah. uh, so hopefully it will reach out to a lot of people but what uh, really uh, you know surprised me was uh, i mean i mentioned this even in the prologue to this book that a lot of mainstream media uh, particularly print media uh, kind of blacked out the book uh, you know they um, they refused to uh, you know carry any coverage about the book or reviews of the book uh, and many of them and bookstores including several in our city bangalore they refused to even stock the book they said we have nothing against the author but then uh, we would not want to keep a book on savarkar in our store so such is yeah. the level of tolerance uh, in uh, for those who keep talking about it but despite that for it to do uh, so well that's why i said it was unexpected and i would attribute that largely to the uh, you know word of mouth social media and the general hunger about uh, i think people in india to know about this man who whom everyone keep talking about all the time in contemporary politics but very few people know what he wrote or what he stood for what his ideology was so it also in a way dismantles this uh, gatekeeper role that a lot of mainstream media kept playing saying we will be the arbiters of who will read what and how and we will position uh, you know writers or books Uh, so now i think these are irrelevant uh, irrespective of what they do or what uh, cancel culture they may go ahead with uh, books and writers can still reach out to their audience through uh, the democratized social media right in fact uh, you anticipated my second question because i actually was going to ask you that um, uh, along with your book came cancel culture again where i mean i was shocked to hear i can understand people not wanting to put savarkar on a pedestal if they disagree with him politically but uh, bookshops not stocking it i mean i have uh, seen copies of mein kampf in yeah. bookshops huh? yeah. and yeah. Uh, they have a problem with a book and a biography of savarkar which is neither a biography nor uh, an uh, uh, you know a rant against uh, savarkar i mean it is trying to put the record as it exists and yeah. as we best know as of today anyway thank you for that uh, initial introduction i actually come to the second volume where you say it is a contested legacy obviously yeah. even your first volume has a contested legacy but the second one uh, 
when we say contested legacy, I mean, today I find that this is a, a subtitle you can give to almost any politician today. I mean, in the West, they are contesting the legacy of uh, their own uh, heroes from Columbus to Winston Churchill. Here we are contesting the legacy of Nehru and uh, for that matter, even Gandhi for that matter. Tomorrow, we are, I, I think the only person who I would dare say is uncontested is probably Ambedkar. Largely mm -hmm. because um, uh, today's politics requires that you put him on a certain pedestal. But regardless of that, uh, I would say that it's fair to call this a contested legacy. What uh, is it only the Hindutva part of the legacy that is contested or his entire aspect of his life? That's a very, very pertinent question. And I think every aspect of his life, uh, Jaggi, because, uh, you know, the Hindutva part, of course, is... Uh, something that is uh, that causes all the fissures uh, within contemporary political discourse but you know i mean constantly the the even on whether it's on social media or it's mainstream media or political parties the kind of narrative that is built ab about uh, you know savarkar's legacy of him uh, starting from him being you know a traitor to the cause of the freedom struggle or someone who sold out to the british who wrote uh, groveling mercy petitions who took a pension and you know worse things i mean he wrote his own autobiography he called his own himself veer uh, you know things like this which almost demean the prestige of a man uh, who sacrificed so much for this country and of course the big uh, you know elephant in the room savarkar's uh, alleged role in the assassination of mahatma gandhi uh, despite his being acquitted uh, honorably several times by the court including recently uh, so all of that uh, you know makes him a very uh, explosive figure uh, for contemporary politics uh, and where his name is dragged even in election speeches in manifestos today whether to confer a bharat ratna on him or not that becomes a um, you know subject of uh, discussion in newsroom studios raucous debates so uh, <laughs> that is the contestation where different people both his proponents and opponents uh, i think are fighting this uh, live battle of history uh, on a person who died way back in 1966 but neither of them unfortunately have done enough uh, to kind of read the man or understand what really he stood for right so uh, let me start with some of the contested parts i'll con i'll start with the three uh, yeah. contesting personalities you met the first one comes fairly early in the book it is the conversation that you reported between maulana shaukat ali and savarkar that's very illuminating that is shaukat ali comes to meet savarkar and he says that look i think i want you to disband hindu sangathan efforts but i will continue with my uh, own community uh, unification efforts so uh, just tell me the two people obviously did not see eye to eye on this fundamentally i mean uh, isn't this contrast telling you that there is some validity to what savarkar was trying to do correct and in fact many people have commented after reading this that probably this seems not like a discussion in 1924 but in 2021 because we are debating <laughs> the same issues 100 yes, years later uh, right. conversions about ghar wapsi about cow uh, you know slaughter um, lynching all of this being talked about even now so in 100 years the sadly the social and political discourse of this country has remained stagnant when it comes to this issue no the, that was a uh, you know it was in the uh, savarkar private papers that i found this communication which his secretary had transcribed and i thought it was very illuminative not for me to paraphrase it but put it in toto so that the first person accounts of both these people and shaukat ali was uh, not just a muslim leader but he was also the the tallest leader of the khilafat agitation that was going on then which and the, one of the closest allies of mahatma gandhi so almost you could say that his voice would have been very similar to what gandhi ji at that time was also prop uh, propagating uh, considering his uh, unequivocal support to khilafat uh, despite the opposition from several people within the congress itself uh, right from annie besant and lalpa lala lajpat rai and later on even swami shraddhanand who time and again warned gandhi ji that you know on uh, on a dais which um, gandhi ji shared with shaukat ali and several other leaders of the khilafat they were open calls to jihad uh, there were verses ayats of the quran which were read which were uh, blatantly violent but then um, uh, when swami shraddhanand uh, of the arya samaj who was also part of the congress also tells gandhi ji that what is it i mean how you as an apostle of non violence how can you sit and listen to this 
open call for murder of kafirs and he says no 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 this is not about us he's they're talking about the british officers and nothing uh, related to us so but then you know the the futility of that argument was displayed amply when you had the mopla carnage uh, against the hindus uh, uh, in malabar or in the riots all across india all through the 1920s where mainly the hindus were the uh, you know victims whether it was kohat gulbarga panipat delhi calcutta bengal the uh, large parts of india and in fact even the british uh, documents i quote who say that you know before there used to just be riots around uh festivals religious festivals like an eid or a ganesh chaturthi or something but now every second day there is uh there, there are communal uh, outbreaks in the country so obviously the the religious mobilization that had been done uh thanks to the khilafat movement in a very very dangerous manner was showing its results and shaukat ali embodies that very uh you know philosophy and he says yeah while it is it is uh okay uh, it's very um kosher for us to do tabligh Uh, or conversions or even rally uh, on a cause like the khilafat movement which was a communal movement it was not right. any struggle for the freedom of this country but for the establishment of a caliphate in turkey uh, on religious grounds when uh, we, we can be allowed to do that but then you uh, are not allowed to do that and so in fact uh, there, uh, there is one uh, uh, you know um, phrase that savarkar also says and i think i'm just searching for that which is very uh, yeah i think very pertinent where he says uh, yeah when he says uh, you know uh, you people should uh, are spoiling the uh, uh, climate of the country by doing hindu sangathan he says for uh, for de- for centuries if a robber is coming and uh, actually robbing our houses and today we are saying that we are locking our doors uh, against theft uh, exactly for the robber to come around and say oh that actually uh, you know uh, denies me of my opportunity to rob you i think that's a very very uh, bad <laughs> argument and so it should not be done so i think that was a very uh, very uh, yeah. apt reparty which uh, had to be given saying as long as savarkar's view point all through was that that as long as uh you know the muslim side keeps stressing on their muslim identity i will keep stressing on my hindu identity the yes. day they drop that and uh, you know of a pan indian identity uh, the, he always said we are vishwa manav we believe in vasudev kutumbakam and so the world is one family so i will go 10 steps forward and embrace you so tit for tat you do this then i will do this as a counter and not the kandian philosophy of uh, uh, you know you slap me on one cheek and i'll show you the other uh, one as well yeah even as an argument uh, it is a bit of an effrontery to say that i can do what i have to do but you cannot do what i am doing correct <laughs> yeah <laughs> the yeah, yeah. Uh, okay the next conversation is the one between say gandhi and savarkar i think gandhi lands up in um, ratnagiri one of course it yeah. was discussed at differences and all and it was not as confrontational as the one between shaukat ali and savarkar mm-hmm. but uh, at the end of the day i don't think they found any meeting ground right yes. in that conversation yes so, uh, but though i don't think it was acrimonious yes or i think they never found meeting ground ever in life i think that was uh, uh, on various issues right from their very first meeting in london uh, as uh young men uh, you know where savarkar offers him prawns and then gandhi refuses and then savarkar says uh, you know uh, we want young men who can eat up the british alive and you can't even eat with us and there's only boiled fish and all of that so the vegetarianism <laughs> aspect apart uh, but then later on they also have this uh, you know lecture during the dasara uh, in london where gandhi ji gives a talk about ram rajya and how non violence is a very important tenet of that ram rajya to which savarkar immediately counters him on stage saying you know even ram rajya had to be established by killing ravana and uh, rama did not go and do a satyagraha in front of rama ravana <laughs> to get sita back and we are celebrating this in dasara where the, the nine days of the devi who is shown with all her uh, you know uh, arms and ammunitions not to not as an ornamental thing but as something to annihilate the evil and if you consider the british raj as evil then they have to be an- annihilated and so that fundamental difference a fundamental uh, uh, approach to how to gain freedom i don't think you know either of them had the same uh, goal in mind that they wanted india free 
but the means were different uh, and that on that they never kind of made peace with each other and the further vexed issue came up with uh, you know gandhi and savarkar's differences on issues of caste uh, you know eradication where savarkar stood for a complete uh, dismantling of the caste system whereas gandhi still believed in the varna uh, order and thought that was the bedrock of hinduism uh, untouchability was all that gandhi was willing to uh, you know uh, remedy whereas savarkar like ambedkar wanted a complete uh, reform of the society and also this issue of hindu muslim uh, you know unity uh, on which they differed and uh, shuddhi uh, or uh, reconversion of uh, people who had been lost to the hindu faith on that also uh, i don't think they saw eye to eye so and of course uh, repeatedly gandhi's uh, you know silence when it came to uh, the sacrifices of the revolutionaries when jatin das uh, you know dies of a hunger strike uh, gandhi remains curiously silent and uh, everybody right from subhash chandra bose to everyone castigates him for that and i've quoted their uh, works extensively where they say why a young man who's followed your philosophy of hunger strike uh, you know he's he's uh, died and it actually the sacrifice did not go in vain because after jatin das's martyrdom was when uh, the british made these categories of prisoners as a b c category where political prisoners were given different uh, you know concessions and pro provisions so uh, despite that gandhi remaining silent on it and saying i would not like to side with the revolutionaries young men who were willing to sacrifice their life i think that also became a running feud between these two men and savarkar wrote these very very acerbic and sarcastic uh, you know pieces against yeah, yeah. gandhi in his shraddhanand uh, that he correct. Did. yeah correct uh, but the corollary to that i mean the, um, Oh, see, one point was on the ideological plane. They obviously could not agree much on anything. But um, how much of Savarkar's say uh, dislike of Gandhi was uh, driven by the fact that Gandhi seemed to find a lot of purchase with the masses, but Savarkar didn't. Yes. Is it also uh, that his vituperativeness against Gandhi was it driven by the fact that his message was not getting through, but uh, Gandhi's was? i agree i think that's a very very uh, apt uh, observation because i have always i have always felt that you know of course there's no corroborative evidence it's just our deduction that uh, when savarkar was at the hey, when he probably you know dismissively spoke of, spoke to gandhi in london he wouldn't have realized that you know in a decade from now uh, when he would be rotting in cellular jail uh and gandhi would have come to india and the situation would have come in such a way that with the death of uh, tilak uh, the position of the congress would have fallen vacant to such an extent that gandhi would occupy national center stage coming all the way from south africa and his uh, in no time you know his voice becoming the voice of the entire national movement uh, whereas he was still sitting in an isolated cell uh, you know in uh, in cellular jail in greater ratnagiri so including his first uh, i've always maintained that the first um, uh, the book that he wrote the hindutva the essentials of hindutva in 1923 from jail Uh, was probably that first intellectual salvo that he fired against gandhi gandhi's hind swaraj uh, the khilafat movement all of that together so in a way uh, there certainly seems to be this uh, insecurity in his mind that um, here was a man who was nowhere in the scene and today he's all over the place and everybody is willing to listen to him it's almost like a, a spell that he has cast on the masses particularly the hindus who were going like you know mice behind the pied piper uh, not knowing whether it was to their destruction or to their uh, you know betterment so yeah right. certainly very valid uh, observation so which brings me to the third dynamic the ambedkar savarkar relationship or interactions to the limit of thing you have to you mention that savarkar tried to get ambedkar on his platform several times but ambedkar mostly uh avoids it for whatever reason maybe genuine reasons maybe strategic reasons yeah um, what do you think uh, is uh, the cause of this dynamic where they often spoke on in similar terms about gandhi or about uh, religious bigotry and caste but when it comes to sharing a platform they didn't want to yeah. or uh, ambedkar didn't want to yeah so yeah i mean there are so many letters where savarkar He repeatedly tells him, you know, I've created this pilot project in Ratnagiri, uh, which is almost uh, almost equal to being a casteless society, where so many things from uh, 
you know, over 13 years that he's, uh, you know, he and his uh, colleagues in the Ratnagiri Hindu Sabha uh, literally slogged to uh, strive for intercaste dining, intercaste marriage, the temple entry, uh, schools for everybody, including the untouchables to sit with, the untouchable Ganapati Utsavs where, you know, it was someone from the so-called lower caste who would be the priest and even the upper caste had to bow, bow down and uh, take blessings from him. All of these, he said, this is a pilot project. We can scale it up to the whole country for people like you. I'm restricted only to Ratnagiri, but you are a free man. So if you can, uh, you know, uh, join hands in 10 years, I think we can remove the scourge of untouchability from this country. And he also writes to him repeatedly that while the usual narrative is the upper caste, uh, you know, oppressing the lower caste. He also points to Ambedkar that, you know, within the lower caste also, there is a hierarchy of oppression. Those, yeah. uh, the Mahars uh, community to which uh, Ambedkar be uh, belong, they would further oppress the caste below them. Uh, you know, you should say the word today for political correctness, but the Bhangis and others who are uh, supposedly below uh, the Mahars, yeah. they would not be allowed into the Maharwada or use the Mahar uh, well. So let's look at a dismantling of that too, to which again, Ambedkar maintains a curious silence. And I think somewhere Ambedkar's motivations were different. Eventually, you know, he also becomes a part of the Viceroy's Council uh, at the height of uh, the freedom movement and at the height of the quit India and, uh, you know, Second World War time. So to be associated with a man like Savarkar, who was constantly under British surveillance, uh, you know, all through his internment in Ratnagiri, uh, would have actually made his life or his career progression also would have been affected perhaps. And uh, yeah, because all through... I mean, the five year restriction that was put on Savarkar, it kept getting extended every two, two years to from five years initially of restricted uh, activity in Ratnagiri and no participation in politics that became 13 long years, uh, which right. that during that entire 13 long years, Savarkar's uh, uh, continuous engagement with the underground revolutionary movement, whether it was Bhagat Singh or Chandrasekhar Azad or uh, Durga Bhabhi and, uh, you know, all of them, Raj Guru, Sukhdev and all, all of them was constantly being monitored by the British. So anybody who was even vaguely associated, I also quote this one incident where there is a, a particular gentleman who, because, uh, you know, he was as a child, he used to go to Savarkar's house uh, to listen to some stories when the police verification happens uh, when he wants to when he's um, appearing for the ias exams he's not given a a, a high rank uh, because you know the police ver verification showed that he had association with savarkar as a small child that was enough to spoil his career as an adult uh, and after clearing the ias uh, you know with distinction and this gentleman mr velankar he was the one who actually introduced the pin code system in india someone who was as illustrious as that and instead of the IAS, he was given the postal service. Postal so service. this kind of, uh, you know, um, untouchability yeah. that was practiced against Savarkar. Obviously, I think Ambedkar also did not want to risk uh, his career and stayed away. But after he came out of Ratnagiri, the, the two of them uh, did meet on a couple of occasions. Right. Uh, could it also be that uh, when Savarkar started inviting him, Ambedkar had already decided that he would uh, leave Hinduism? So, uh, could it be that he did not want to be associated with anything that smacked of some kind of Hindu form? Not yet. I mean, even the 1920s, late 1920s was when he had started the Mahat Satyagraha and also Temple Entry, entry uh, Satyagraha, which Savarkar supported as the only person who probably stood by him. I think his decision to leave Hinduism was much later. Uh, okay in the 50s and by in the 30s and so on, he was still very much a part of the Hindu fold. Uh, yeah, but the constant, uh, you know, apprehension and the allegation also against Savarkar was that he was not doing social reforms uh, for the sake of social reforms alone, but also for a consolidation of the Hindu community numerically, uh, considering how important it was uh, for, from political uh, uh, angle and for representation, especially after the communal award, that your right. population proportion would determine your strength in the legislatures. So, which was nothing wrong in uh, a consolidation of society, but that was also one thing that it was not just uh, altruist, altruistic, you know, social reforms that were being thought of. It was also that it had a political uh, agenda, which is fine. Yeah. So, uh, on the specific issue of uh, caste and elimination and elimination of caste, caste atrocities and other things, was there an attitudinal difference between Savarkar and Ambedkar? 
I don't see that actually. In fact, when I see the, uh, uh, as I said, the motives may be different. Um, uh, Savarkar came from both. I mean, the, the consolidation of the Hindu community for uh, electoral purposes, as I mentioned, and also, I mean, it was an evil that he strongly believed had to go. Uh, Ambedkar, of course, came from the second part. Yeah, I was a victim of the same, uh, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. someone from the same community while Savarkar was a Brahmin. Uh, so, uh, to that extent, I don't think there was a fundamental difference. Both of them, in fact, Ambedkar writes to him and I quote him saying, you're the only one who understands uh, that the Varna system is at the root cause of all the caste evils and its elimination is what is important. Nobody else understands. Uh, at a time when Gandhi was actually saying that he believes uh, yeah. the Varna system. He doesn't consider it to be odious and any shaking up of the Varna system would bring down the edifice of Hinduism down itself and so on. So, yeah, that yeah. Is, attitudinally, they had a very similar uh, approach. Right. Uh, on the uh, whole Muslim and partition question, uh, uh, they seem to have slightly, uh, in fact, if you look at uh, Ambedkar's uh, tract on Pakistan, Actually, he seems to come even more strongly against them than even uh, Savarkar. In fact, he attacks Savarkar for yeah. not trying to sort of uh, completely submerge them within Hindu or this thing. Or something. What is the point in giving them equal status in uh, uh, India and things like that? So on the communal question, it seems like they were quite similar in some ways. But uh, Ambedkar seems a little more extreme than Savarkar in this case. Very true. Huh? Very, very true. In fact, Savarkar pales in comparison. Where yeah. I think both of them uh, agreed that these were this was a clash of civilizations. These were very very different theological uh, uh, you know uh, standpoints, and so the meeting ground would be so less. Uh, but while Savarkar maintained that despite these differences, can we live together under a constitutional framework uh, where nobody is given any extra privileges and rights, everyone is equal in the eyes of the law. But for him, territorial integrity, considering the sacred geography of India was so important, uh, that was also very uh, vital that there's no vivisection of the country on religious grounds. Uh, but there Ambedkar deferred saying, you know, if uh, there are two nations within this country, and if a major nation and a minor nation coexist, either the minor nation has to subsume itself completely into the major nation, or if you're keeping it alive by allowing, uh, as Savarkar propounded, that you know their religious symbols or their culture, their language, everything religion is allowed, then that is festering um, seeds of uh, national disintegration, uh, you know, uh, threat to sovereignty, national sovereignty, and all of that, which was Ambedkar's views. And in fact, even Ambedkar's uh, thoughts of how uh, the communal composition of the Indian army, uh, British yeah. Indian army was so skewed towards uh, the, uh, the Muslim community, which was the only reason why the British were being so favorable to the Muslims uh, all the time. There's that very telling comment where Mountbatten, uh, before coming to India, he meets uh, Churchill uh, and Churchill tells him, please take care of uh, the Muslims there. Not a hair, strand of hair should be uh, affected because they've been our allies and friends all through. So uh, the importance that one community was getting only largely because of their, uh, you know, uh, role in the uh, army was also something that Ambedkar flagged off. So today, yeah. I mean, today, sadly, Ambedkar's uh, pictures become the posters in anti-CAA protests and all of that by people yeah. who realize that he would have been the first one to support a law like this, uh, right. which talks of religious minorities on uh, either side of India. Right. In fact, he actively has called for an exchange of population. Yes, yes. Which, uh, I mean, we literally talk about moving millions of people, lock, stock and barrel here and there. <laughs> Though of course, some happened because of the riots, but he said you must physically move most of them, otherwise the whole point of partition is lost. Yes. I think that was his view, whereas Savarkar did not go that far. Yes, yes, yes. He still believed that we could live together. And first of all, and the Hindu Mahasabha was the only political entity which opposed partition tooth and nail till the very end, till um, almost May 1947, when it was a no-brainer that the country was going to get divided. The Congress was willing to accept partition as early as even 1942, even before the idea of partition was uh, fructified, uh, when the peace mission came uh, to India. And the Congress was happy to get the defense portfolio in exchange for a uh, breakup of the uh, subcontinent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Gandhi probably was the only one who was trying to see if he could oppose it. Yes, yes. 
but i think after that interim government i think patel swung over quite clearly in favor of partition okay. yes yes yeah okay now we come to the big uh, thing in savarkar's life which actually brought down his whole image that is the gandhi murder right yeah so yeah. Mm, just to ask you a more straightforward question do you really think after looking at all the evidence that savarkar had some role to play either in encouraging somebody to do something or being at least informed of it in advance i don't uh, think so because i mean i've uh, actually uh, gone through about 11000 pages of uh, the national archives of india the gandhi murder trial gone through all the testimonies the kapoor commission uh, papers and all of that uh, this there's absolutely no corroborative evidence anywhere to say uh, that these uh, people uh, whether it was nathuram godse or narayan apte actually uh, um, you know got got inspired from savarkar to actually commit the murder uh, that they were all opposed to gandhi ideologically and uh, throughout Uh, they were opposed to him ideologically that was a uh, that was certain i mean yeah, yeah that was all the time certain and uh, nathuram and uh, you know apte and others were very close to savarkar um, where he formed the hindu rashtra dal within the hindu mahasabha in the 19 early 1940s um, so uh, of course savarkar went to the other extreme in court uh, which was very economical with the truth saying i don't even know them very well they are just like any other uh karyakarta of the hindu mahasabha which was far from truth uh, because uh, they were in the inner circles uh, till about 1945 or so but because after 1945 savarkar's own health uh, deteriorated so badly uh, he had uh, very fatal heart attacks and almost lost his life and so he was totally confined away from uh, political work and with the um virtual collapse of the hindu mahasabha in the elections in 1946 his position had further diminished so i think all these young men and god say in his uh, dying declaration the testimony himself says that towards the end you know savarkar was becoming very pacifist uh, and becoming very conciliatory towards the new indian government and so we decided that uh, we cannot uh, save the hindu community uh, by listening to him and we need to chart our own course uh so the 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 tragedy of uh, the entire it's a com- comic tragedy the way they planned this whole assassination where till the 12th of january 1948 gandhi ji was not even their target uh, you know they had these fantastic plans of bombing the pakistan assembly uh, when it was in session so the jinnah and everyone is killed Uh, not going into the fine detail as to how do you plan to you know transport all the explosives across the border, uh, but then you had to do retribution. The motherland had to be uh, you know justice had to be done, and all kinds of passionate uh, you know young blood which was oozing out. Uh, but then uh, and then they wanted to loot the Nizam's treasury while it was being taken from uh, Maharashtra to Hyderabad state and all of that. Then suddenly on twelfth of January nineteen forty eight, just eighteen days before the actual act. Uh, they decide that gandhi ji needs to be killed because uh, he had gone on a he decided to go on a fast and to death um, to force the government of india to give 50 crores to pakistan uh, at a time when pakistan was actually attacking kashmir uh, the tribesmen were attacking kashmir um, and the government actually bent uh, over and gave that money and that money was perhaps used against india itself and gandhi had all these other plans that there should be a road connecting east and west pakistan so that it's very conducive for them so the imagine the uh, problems <laughs> of the <laughs> road cutting through the heart of india uh, cutting these two uh, land masses so all of this i think they in an impulse they decided that we have found our enemy we have found our target we wanted to do something for the nation now the opportunity has presented itself and so within the the first attempt that was made was on 20th of january so in that seven days uh, it's so highly unlikely that they would have gone and had this uh, discussion with savarkar and he would have told them or uh, because in that seven days they had to travel between pune mumbai delhi uh, arrange all the explosives go there do a recce of the birla house uh, where gandhi ji's prayer they had tried to uh, you know bomb him there on 20th of january which failed uh, so mm. it's very unlikely that in this interim just 7 days they he was actually the inspirational uh, person behind it i've made uh, you know in detail yeah. on through all those yeah. testimonies of that shanta modak this actress right. 
several others who say yeah they saw him uh, saw these people getting into savarkar's house etc which was not corroborated with evidence yeah. while i would right. state that the ideological inspiration so to say uh, for yeah. anti gandhism not necessarily uh, assassination yeah yeah, yeah uh, ideological and intellectual opposition to gandhi was perhaps inspired uh, no doubt by savarkar but the final decision to kill him uh, was in my view as you know as an honest observation of all the uh, records was a very brash uh, and uh, personal one of god say and uh, yeah it was taken very impulsively without much thought or yeah. strategy yeah in fact they did a lot of damage in the process Then yes towards the end uh, you hint uh, you quote somebody to hint at the possibility that savarkar may have helped god say write his final speech mm. in fact uh, justice kosla who presided over the trial in his book says very much that he made such an impassioned speech that if the people listening to it had to give the verdict they would have pronounced him not yeah. guilty so uh, do you think that savarkar was behind the penmanship i don't think so uh, the the person i quote is uh, tushar gandhi uh, yeah, yeah. Is, let us kill uh, gandhi but Be that was yeah so so on the one hand uh, there is also the accounts of uh, the lawyer uh, p l yeah. inam who was the lawyer of uh, gopal god say and also dr parchure uh, who were the accused in the murder who uh, says and i quote him in the book where the, you know he says savarkar kept such distance from nathuram that uh, he almost kind of disowned him and whether in the uh, cell or in the court they would not even make eye contact and nathuram was yearning for that uh, uh, you know touch of affection from tatyara or a look of uh, you know uh, um, compassion so there was so much i think he just wanted to and even when inamdar himself goes to savarkar's uh, you know cell in the red fort where he was uh, imprisoned uh, during the trial uh, he says uh, he was only concerned about his exoneration he did not even inquire about the other uh, accused or what so either right. of it can be true where you know either you're distancing yourself so much or you're actually writing uh, his speech also uh, which uh, tushar gandhi i think may uh, uh, brings us out without any again evidence it's conjecture he feels that the language is like savarkar but then god say grew up uh, you know as a yeah. young man being highly under the spell of savarkar he was a secretary yeah. in ratnagiri he learned english and journalism and everything under savarkar so obviously there would be uh, you know may very similar uh, view point when it came to articulation or writing yeah. and so on and he right. was an editor of a newspaper himself uh, right. the agrani and later the hindu rashtra so i'm sure his language skills would be equally fiery and good uh, if not as much as savarkar's so right. uh, to assume that it's, it's just an assumption and not based on any facts right so let's come to the um, uh, this thing you know savarkar the ideologue and the savarkar the sangathan organizer huh? yeah it means that the he was more successful in the former role where he was an ideologue and gave some ideas yes. than in the yeah. latter because none of his uh, sangathan works really succeeded beyond yeah. the small yeah. experiments in ratnagiri or whatever yeah. but to masaba itself disappeared from the scene soon after independence yes so Uh, why do you think so i mean as opposed to that some organization that seems less ideologically clear or even confused like the rashtriya swayamsevak sangh they seem to have survived nearly 100 years yeah but uh, this man whose ideological clarity was brilliant could not actually save his own organization except that the ideology survived but the sangathan of the anushtha did yeah another group which had a sangathan has survived but the ideology is still not very clear <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's very very uh, that's a excellent question because uh, yeah i i think i've always maintained that he's he's not been a great leader because a, a leader is also one who cultivates uh, you know followers who who is able to uh, ensure that people buy into your uh, you know argument whether i mean gandhi did it through force through emotional blackmail that if you don't <laughs> listen to me i'm going to go on a fast and <laughs> and everybody had to fall in uh, line but even otherwise i mean in the hindu mahasabha the fact that there was so much of factional feuds uh, between him and his protege shama prasad mukherjee uh, the factions of 
Raja Maheshwar Dayal Seth and uh, so many others uh, who are there um, in the in the organization, the Bengal faction, the Maharashtra faction. Maybe it's common in a political party, but it went to such an extent that the uh, party itself got liquidated towards uh, the end of the you know 1940s. Uh, I think the biggest difference between an organization like the RSS that you mentioned and the Hindu Mahasabha was that though they be believed in the same you know, Saffron Brotherhood or the Hindutva philosophy, uh, the, um, the organization like the Mahasabha and particularly the Savarkarite faction relied too much on a particular individual and there was hero worship around, built around that particular individual. They yeah. looked for an icon, either living or dead, uh, whether it was mythological figures, Lord Ram, Lord Krishna, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, um, Shambhaji Maharaj, all of these were made into icons to uh, revere Tilak and so on. And among the living, it had to be Savarkar. So you could uh, be a part of the Mahasabha only if you were completely faithful to this one individual. And the organization's, uh, you know, uh, fortunes rose or fell as the individual's fortunes rose and fell. So as Savarkar's currency came down in the political uh, spectrum, the Hindu Mahasabha also naturally died. Whereas I think in the case of the RSS, they've always maintained that the individual is, uh, you know, subservient to the larger cause or the ideology, which makes them more embracing of everything, uh, you know. So in a, in a RSS Shakha, it is still okay to have Gandhiji as one of their Pratas Maraniyas, as a person of reverence, uh, but that would be completely anathema in a Hindu Mahasabha gathering where you could not pay reverence to uh, Gandhi because that would be uh, blasphemous to your love for Savarkar. So this, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this, you know, this identification <laughs> of one individual, I think that led right. to the downfall of the Mahasabha and the fact that the RSS has maintained that where who becomes a Sarfant Chalak or who is his uh, assistant and all, the, those are irrelevant. Uh, yeah. They can come and go but the sung goes Sun on. Which yeah. yeah. is why I think it has grown from strength to strength in these uh, one century of its existence. Yeah. So we come to the uh, two down cycles of post uh, Gandhi assassination in Savarkar's life. One is this part of it seems to be a slightly uh, lower trajectory, though he may have written a lot. But like, I mean, when he, uh, Andamans was a traumatic experience. But when he came back, he was a hero and a rebel. Yeah. But post Gandhi, uh, regardless of whether he had anything to do with it or not, uh, it seems that there was some kind of a lowering of the tempo of the Savarkar uh, ethos or, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the, the strength of his uh, personality. Would that be correct? Very much because uh, he realized that there was also personal animosity uh, uh, against him from the highest power in the country, the Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, and he made it clear on several occasions, including he was unwilling to even share stage with Savarkar when the uh, uh, centenary celebrations of the 1857 uh, uprising on which Savarkar had researched and written that book. Uh, Nehru okay. refuses to share stage, uh, you know, with, uh, with Savarkar then. And in, even in the 1951 election campaign, like it is happening today, uh, I think Nehru uh, time and again kept saying the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS are the assassins of Gandhi, though by then the, um, you know, the court had already delivered its verdict saying they were not part of it. Uh, but despite that, it was used for electoral purposes. And more blatantly, I think when the nehru Liaquat Ali Pact was being signed, uh, a total, you know, draconian, uh, the Preventive uh, Detention Act was used and all political opposition, which was mainly only in the Hindu Mahasabha then, everybody was put under, um, uh, behind the bars because the section of that act which said anybody who talks about dismemberment of another country is a traitor to this country and it's a threat to national security. So since the Hindu Mahasabha was talking for Akhand Bharat and a merger of Pakistan, uh, that was construed as being anti-India <laughs> and anti-national and all of them put in jail and an undertaking taken from everyone, including Savarkar, that till the time the elections are held, you're not going to make political statements. So, you know, uh, you win elections by actually killing all your political opposition, not giving them any chance to uh, campaign or say anything political and then say, yeah, the people are with us uh, and we won on a democratic basis and there's freedom of expression. So uh, in such a scenario, I think, he was rather disillusioned and he kept away for some time, but he, he kept constantly, uh, you know, drawing the attention of the government um, to the dangers of the time, whether it was, uh, you know, China, 
which he thought was not a, a neighbor whom we could uh, trust and the uh, you know over uh, bearing of the panchil and the hindu hindi ch chini bhai bhai and all that that was going on that we need to go with cautious optimism and that proved its uh, worth as early as 62 and continues to prove even now and also the northeast uh, which he saw the the changing demographics there and how that could lead to uh, you know threat to national security uh, through um, secessionist movements which also came uh, to be true so on all these things he was writing still he was writing in the kesari a few uh, magazines here and there but by and large i think again the uh, uh, social paraya the political paraya that he had become by then because the constant jibe was yeah the court may have exonerated you but uh, you know the moral albatross still hangs around your neck uh, of the gandhi yeah. murder which in fact patel writes in that letter to shama prasad mukherjee that your leader may be exonerated legally but uh, the moral question will still hang and unfortunately mm -hmm. that hangs that uh, right. date yeah, yeah that that hangs till this date though even as recent as 2018 he was exonerated by the supreme court of india uh, from any kind of even a suspicion of his role in the gandhi uh, murder so i think that made him very disillusioned and he so even the end of his life was not uh, a natural death he uh, you know ends it in that jain tradition of uh, pari operation uh, where you give up food and uh, water and medicines and all of that yeah right um, the other thing uh, the down cycle of post murder was uh, there was a huge uh, response and attacks on brahmins in uh, maharashtra right so um, uh, was this because of the savarkar effect or is it independent of that uh, or there are some other caste assertion going on that uh, sort of just came at this tipping point yeah and where uh, there was anger against the uh, murder of gandhi yeah yeah that also has been a secret that has been hidden from the country for so long uh, that you know it was a trailer i always say of the 1984 uh, sikh genocide that was done in yeah. delhi uh, after indira gandhi's murder but uh, you know the same kind of thing done under, uh, but this also congress fellows who did it yes 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 largely largely them and that is uh, substantiated by the accounts of the tallest one of the tallest leaders of the congress himself you know dwarka prasad mishra who was a home minister uh, none less than the home minister of the central provinces uh, who says that more than 100 very very senior congressmen uh, who held uh, you know responsible positions they were the ones who led mobs uh, and there was simmering anger you're right that there was this antipathy towards the maharashtrian brahmins particularly the uh, you know chitpavan brahmins who were in positions of power for centuries uh, you know uh, since the peshwa was a you know chitpavan himself and so yeah. his fellow caste mates were given a lot of importance in administration given lands um, and wealth and so on so this it was a culmination of an anti uh, brahmin anti uh, hindu mahasabha anti rss and also in parts like uh, kolhapur and so on there was also the anti Samyukta Maharashtra movement, uh, all of which culminated in this uh, anti Brahmin riots. Where, but then the sad part is these have been undocumented, FIRs were never registered, cases were not filed, uh, the accused just went away uh, scot free. And to this day, uh, you know, the victims, uh, the few eyewitnesses whom I still managed to, you know, source and interview, yeah, yeah. and also their uh, um, family members, their successors. They are unwilling yeah. to identify themselves openly. Uh, it all goes under, even in my book, their voices that I quote in the appendix are all under anonymous because most of them are scared to talk because people who led those mobs or who uh, um, engineered these riots, their successors or those parties are in very powerful positions in Maharashtra today. And many people would not want to identify themselves and put their lives at risk. They say, we've moved on in life, we've rebuilt our life. We don't want to create a further trouble to ourselves or our families so i think that becomes a duel you know on the one hand you don't even uh, you don't even uh, acknowledge that such a you don't even give justice to the victims the adding insult to that injury is that you know you deny its very occurrence which is what yeah. has so there was hardly there were a, a few random stray incidents which was not true i think it was uh, it was a concerted plan to ethnically yeah. cleanse 
several villages in Maharashtra, which even today don't have too many Brahmin families. Most of them have migrated to the cities. Uh, and Savarkar himself, there was a mob of about 1000 people who attacked his house. And he somehow managed to, uh, because of police uh, protection, he managed to save. But his younger brother, Narayan Rao, uh, yeah, was, actually, uh, was beaten. Yeah was beaten and then he died uh, much later. So a lot of people had to pay the price for this uh, episode. Yeah, in fact, we saw something similar, uh, though not necessarily on this communal scale, with James Lane's book on Shivaji. The, suddenly you find the same forces actually attacked the Mandarkar Institute, yes. thinking they must have put some stuff in this which should not have come. Yeah. Know? I think that was also there. Anyway, uh, coming to the last two questions, um, basically one, uh, do you think there was any truth to that Patel wanted to have a deal with the son? You know, of course, they're not about Savarkar, but post the murder trial and other, that he wanted them to be part of the Congress. Is that right? There, uh, I mean, Patel was certainly disillusioned with Nehru. And yeah. the fact I also quoted. You know, again, on that very, I don't know what all happened on 12th of January, 1948, but then on 12th of January, there's also a letter that was exchanged between uh, uh, people of the Hindu Mahasabha and the, the Mahakaushal province Hindu Mahasabha and also these same people, D.P. Mishra and others who were in the Congress, who were trying to create a, uh, facilitate a meeting between Patel and uh, Savarkar, uh, where Patel uh, was probably planning to migrate uh, to another party or there were some murmurs around that and he had uh, and Gandhi had always maintained you know that Shama Prasad Mukherjee is the most uh, uh, you know the, the best congressman in the Hindu Mahasabha and Patel is the best Hindu Mahasabha in the Congress so it was open uh, secret that uh, you know, yeah. where the affections uh, lay for both these leaders uh, yeah. so I'm sure there was a, a lot of I mean even minutes before Gandhi died, the last person he met was Sardar Patel and his daughter uh, Mani Bain. And then they had this long discussion where Patel said he's going to quit the government and he has no, he's so fed up with Nehru and so on. And Gandhi tries to coax him and say, I will create a, a agreement between both of you. You're both important as my two eyes. And over the next couple of days, I will create a rapprochement before, between the two of you. But that was not to happen. Uh, so uh, at that stage, I think with Gandhi also dead, uh, I don't think Patel would have then uh, dared to actually, you know, want to kind of go against Nehru and give a clean check to the RSS. He would not have gained anything politically by doing that uh, because he knew for sure that Nehru was strictly against the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS. If there was someone who could have still stood by him, it would have been Gandhiji. But with Gandhiji also not in the scene. Uh, to put himself out at a time when actually uh, people in the Congress were insinuating that he as the Home Minister had not done enough to safeguard the life of Gandhi. Uh, at such a time, by giving a clean chit to the RSS, he had really nothing to gain politically. So in fact, the letters that I've written, uh, you know, uh, which I've quoted uh, in the book, written by Patel to Shama Prasad Mukherjee time and again asks him uh, to disassociate from the Hindu Mahasabha, to disassociate from the RSS. So he was also assuming that anti Sangh, uh, uh, you know, stand then. I don't think there is much uh, to before Gandhi's murder. Certainly there was a chance of uh, the twin meeting. But after that, I think it's sealed for good that there was no political gains by al aligning with the Sangh or with the Mahasabha. Right. So uh, on a more personal note, while you're writing the book over the last five years, both researching and writing it, um, are there any particular anecdotes or some in important incidents that you think come to the mind when you talk about your experience over the last five years? Uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a huge uh, I mean, roller coaster. I'm almost I've, I've written in the prologue that it feels like I've exorcised a ghost. Uh, because it felt it was very I was very diffident to be honest to be even un to undertake this task and I've mentioned in the prologue that you know my mother had given me this uh, guidance that when you're climbing Mount Everest you shouldn't keep looking up saying how many more steps are left to be climbed or you shouldn't look back saying how much have you traversed just keep going one step at a time and before you know you'll be at the summit and I think that's what I followed and <laughs> yeah, though she had never done mountain climbing herself, I don't know how she came up with this uh, <laughs> advice, but it helped. Uh, but, you know, particularly, I think for me, uh, 
several realizations <laughs> that you know someone like a savarkar someone like, who's the father of hindutva being actually a revolutionary uh, and also a social reformer both these uh, you know descriptions being appropriated in contemporary parlance by communists and marxists uh, yeah. the fact that the hindutva uh, you know, of that wouldn't be there yeah 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 that he was uh, he was both a revolutionary and a social reformer who stood for earth shattering reforms i think that was very uh, illuminative and uh, it was deeply emotional to just go to cellular jail and uh, i think anybody who any young person today in india who would uh, be taken there who would be uh, just see the kind of tortures that our forefathers actually went through and whom we don't even have the gratitude to uh, thank or the names also we don't know um, as even as we celebrate 75 years of our freedom uh, that shows the level of ingratitude we have as a nation and as a people uh, that was deeply emotional and i think it left me troubled uh, for several days just to hear all those stories we have a very bad sound and light show that is still you know right from the 1970s it's running there in cellular jail <laughs> using technology a lot more can be done and the Yeah, cellular yeah. jail can become like a place of pilgrimage for uh, you know students uh, of history yes. who should be taken there and uh, made to relive uh, what all the the uh, the kind of right. atrocities that were faced so i think these were very very transformative moments uh, and very emotional moments for me personally as an individual i learned a lot uh, about our uh, freedom struggle of which we are told a very very sanitized uh, very sanitized and limited version limited sanitized yeah very monochromatic yeah. version of it which i think uh, it's time at least now uh, we are mature as a democracy and we are celebrating se- the 75th year at least now all these subaltern voices so to say which have been suppressed uh, the, they should find yeah. their uh, uh, yeah. utterance as uh, the famous twist with destiny speech went that all the soul yeah. of a nation long suppressed should finally find uh, you know uh, yeah yeah place. so i understand you are planning some biography of uh, two other contested at least one other contested legacy that of tipu sultan <laughs> and uh, also shivaji i mean well, shivaji at least has a reasonable amount of documentation and tipu sultan has definitely been more polarizing yeah. so um, uh, what kind of time frame are you looking at i think by 2025 i need to uh, have a commitment with my publishers uh, penguin random house to come out with these two and another book uh, three books actually one more on uh, you know unsung heroes and heroines of india uh, from different parts of the country and yeah. different time spans so these three right. books yeah and tipu sultan i think i'm uh, i'm a sucker for punishment uh, <laughs> living yeah, yeah. in bangalore okay. to stepping on a minefield knowingly <laughs> yes i thought the same when i was uh, stepping on savarkar too but maybe it's going to be in india today at least i think we can have discussions about these alternative narratives of history which is a good thing uh, 20 years ago or even 10 years or 15 years ago i think a mainstream discussion like this uh, like what we are having on savarkar today would have been unthinkable uh, so similarly maybe yeah, everybody's role even shivaji maharaj though he's been appropriated by uh parties and uh, groups of people i think it would need reevaluation of course yeah you did mention james lane you know a lot of historians i think also willfully uh, want to provoke people for no reason i mean to yeah. to cast aspersions on uh, someone's mother and all that obviously it uh, triggers a reaction not yeah. really the way it should have but i think if one sticks adheres to facts adheres to no, i'm going even further i mean you have jadunath sarkar and a lot of men yeah. and others who have done a lot of that Okay. Of course, definitely work can still be done. Okay. So I definitely think you can do that. What about you never thought of Ambedkar as a subject worth doing in five volumes? <laughs> <laughs> Because he is one guy whose uh, legacy is not going to be contested in the foreseeable future. Yes. Because I, I think the one big book that got written and was fairly critical of him was Arun Shaurey's book. Yes. Uh, yes. And it got pilloried by a certain group of people. Yeah. but i think a fair assessment of the man both the positives and the negatives is still worth the try don't you think i i fully agree yeah i think i should undertake that project when i finally decide to take asylum outside india and, <laughs> and don't have much left uh, in this country anymore or whatever and then safely write it from the confines outside india like a salman rushdie or somebody can write what they want <laughs> because yeah he is a political minefield a holy cow who who can't be touched uh, in a right. objective way and arun right. shauri 
whom I greatly admire, is the only one who's probably uh, had the courage to put things out as they were. Yeah, even Ramchandra Goa said as much that it's difficult to write an objective biography of the man. Yeah. Given the fact that a man who railed against hero worship has become the ultimate object of hero worship. Yeah, and a man who uh, stood against social untouchability like a Savarkar is a social and political untouchable today, uh, which is also an irony. Of yeah, that's right, that's right, correct, absolutely. Fantastic, Vikram. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. And uh, yeah, for viewers, please do read this book. I can tell you it's a fantastic book. You will be a lot enlightened by it. Please take the trouble to read both the volumes, the first half of it, where, which ends with Hindutva and the second half, which is the consequences of his thought process, which uh, uh, was there in the rest of the life, ending in the culmination of the assassination of Gandhi, in which he was not involved, but in which he has been repeatedly associated. And of course, the final demonization of Savarkar till the end of his life. Hopefully, now we can have a more rational conversation around the man. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so very much. <laughs>